We live in very dark and disturbing times right now. We are witnesses to um, endless wars and to rampant militarism. Everywhere we see um, uncontrolled uh, growth of corporate capitalism and uh, the impoverishment of peoples. We see unparalleled state repression and government surveillance of our activities and the violation of our privacy rights. We live right now, you must appreciate, in an utterly unique historical moment. Right now, we live amidst the world's sixth extinction crisis in the history of this planet. The last five were all caused by natural events. This one is human made. The last one was 65 million years ago. The current one is happening as we speak. We also live in an era of climate change that has been caused by humans. This climate change is almost at the tipping point, the point of, irre of irreversibility, or what they call runaway climate change. And no matter what we do, it's, it's happening. And by the year 2050, the United Nations says we will live on a planet that is unrecognizable. So, welcome to progress. This is the harvest of thousands of years of so-called civilization. And again, by civilization, I mean the agricultural society, this radical new mode of production that we started 10,000 years ago. As opposed to all of our history, millions of years before that, when we lived in nomadic, small hunting gathering tribes. In some sense, as I'll describe, although progress is a modern concept, it really began for most people once we made this transition from hunting gathering tribes to settled agricultural tribes and we began to domesticate animals and plants or to master nature. So progress in our culture has been defined as the replacement of nature by culture, as a transition from savagery to civilization, as the growing power to command nature for our purposes through science, technology, and capitalist markets. Progress has been defined to the extent to which we can control and, ma uh, and exploit animals, the environment, and pre-modern peoples. Progress is the religion of our day. It is still believed in. Politicians universally speak in the language of progress. And yet this concept, for any critical thinker, is so discredited, uh, it is obvious that it is laden with problematic assumptions. So we have lived in dominator cultures for 10,000 years that implicitly then explicitly assumed that we were making steady progress. And now, and now, we, we live in a state such that we are in contradiction with the natural world. The earth is telling us that our ideas and our way of lives are false. That the way we are living is wrong uh, and uh, impossible to sustain. So the earth is telling us that our so-called civilization is based upon one gigantic mistake and it will erase it. So um, this is a difficult time to uh, talk about progress, to make any kind of argument for progress at all. Who in this room believes that the next generation's life will be better than this generation's life? Who in this room believes, as parents always did, that their children will live in a better world and have a better life than they did? Who in this room believes that homes and health care and education will be affordable for their children or the next generation? Who in this room believes that the great animals that we love to see, the lions, the tigers, and the elephants, will be around for your children or the next generation to see even in a zoo? Who in this room would wish upon their worst enemy that they be born at the end of this century? Because in all likelihood, by the end of this century, this planet will be a living hell. And didn't the dream of the Enlightenment 
that if we create a rational culture and we had rational human beings, we could have peace and harmony and prosperity for the whole world, who believes that the dream of the Enlightenment is still alive? Didn't the Enlightenment die on the slaughter bench of the, 21st cent of the 20th century? Didn't the Enlightenment die on the slaughter bench of world wars, genocide, totalitarianism, Nazism, and concentration camps? And now here we are, barely out of the starting gates of the 21st century, which virtually began with 9-11, which led to a so-called attack, uh, a war on terror, which is really a war on democracy. And everywhere civil liberties are under attack. Everywhere we see people fighting over scarce resources. Everywhere we see the gap between the rich and the poor grow wider and wider. Everywhere we see, we see human desperation grow. Everywhere we see the environment deteriorate, the oceans die, and the rainforests fall. And every time we blink, another species has vanished from the face of the earth. Now, uh, this has led... Uh, the, the death of the Enlightenment uh, mythology, that reason equals freedom, that reason will bring freedom. This Enlightenment mythology, this modern mythology, has led to postmodern thinking or to postmodern thought. And if you've ever wondered what is this postmodern stuff about, uh, to an important part, it is about uh, rejecting uh, the ideas of the Enlightenment and of modern thought as completely false, as metaphysics. So according to the French thinker uh, uh, Jean-Francis Lyotard, we live in a postmodern condition. This, this postmodern condition is defined as a skepticism toward meta-narratives. And the meta-narrative that's told by Western civilization, that's told by Hegel, that's told by Marx, that's told by so many thinkers is this, that reason equals freedom. That to the extent we can develop rational cultures, we will be free. And this, this, is, this goes back to Socrates, the idea that uh, we only do the wrong when we don't know the right, that we're really rational beings. And of course, Nietzsche and Freud said that this is, uh, that this is a myth, and that we are animals, and that we have a very violent, destructive, and self-destructive core to our being. And so uh, we had uh, the work of the Frankfurt School in the 1940s, uh, Adorno and Horkheimer, for instance. And they had lived through the death of Marxism. They had lived through uh, the, the, the building of concentration camps. They had lived through Nazism and fascism. And they saw decades before Lyotard did that this equation is false. They saw that rationality does not necessarily lead to freedom, that it leads to what they call the totally administered society. It leads to Auschwitz, to concentration camps, to factory farms, and to atomic weapons. So, progress is uh, the core myth of modernity, as I said, and it's a very seductive myth because it legitimates modernity. It tells us that this system is bringing something good for everyone and eventually uh, all boats will rise uh, as the markets do and eventually we will, we will all be the beneficiaries of progress. But if progress is a lie and you can attach it to your own class interests and you can get the rest of the people to believe that you are the vehicle of progress, then uh, you have control over the people because progress uh, has been an alibi or an excuse for greed and for the exploitation of humans, animals, and the earth. So all of the horrors, all of the nightmares, all of the disasters perpetuated in the name of progress, in the name of civilization, invite us to reject these concepts completely. But I suggest this would be a mistake. I suggest there's something we can salvage about this concept of progress that's important that indeed we can't do without. I believe that uh, we need this concept of progress as a moral map and a compass to guide us to a better world. For how else can we gauge whether things are getting better?
obviously things need to get better because uh, they can't get much worse. And so in some sense, we are going to need a concept of progress that we are making progress in our personal lives, in our social lives, in our consciousness, etc. But obviously, we're going to have to reconstruct this concept in some very serious ways. It's going to have to be a concept that uh, will measure progress in the most universal possible way for humans, for animals, and for the environment. We are going to measure progress according to a new universalism, a radical egalitarianism, a boundless notion of, of the moral community, and an ethics that are more inclusive than anything that we've ever seen. Now, a bit uh, on, the, on the history, uh, quickly, on the history of uh, the concept of progress. As I said, really, this is a, a modern concept. It, it did not begin to get uh, developed until the 17th, 18th, and certainly by the 19th centuries. Because the ancients, you see, uh, the, uh, the Greeks, the Romans, the Stoics, uh, they all had a very pessimistic view of the world. It was a cyclical view of the world that uh, things happen, but nothing ever really changes. That it's just the ebb and flow in time, the rise and fall of empires, the same pattern that repeats itself over and over, what Nietzsche called the eternal recurrence. Many historians equated in the ancient world the passage of time with decay and corruption, not something getting better and better. So the Greco-Roman worldview was fatalistic, it was deterministic, and it was cyclical. Obviously, this does not lead us to a concept that the world is getting better and better for more and more. So for the concept of progress to arise, uh, quite a few things have to happen. We need a positive view of change. We need a new view of the universe that is not hostile to our ability to alter it for our good. We need to, renun we need to renounce the idea of a fixed human nature. And we need an optimistic belief that things can get better and better. And we need the material forces which can bring this about. So once with modernity, with the scientific revolutions, with the Renaissance and with the Enlightenment, and we we're able to unchain reason from the shackles of dogma and to develop rationality in a free way, we began to prepare the material forces that could bring about progress, or the illusion of progress, at least. These would be three principal forces that have constructed the modern and postmodern world uh, since uh, at least uh, the 16th, 17th centuries and on. These forces are science, technology, and capitalism. So as science started to get more and more sophisticated, we began to understand the world. For instance, when Newton grasped the laws of gravity, this was a fantastic advance. I cannot underestimate how excited the world became that we could understand and, 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 and master the laws, the secrets of nature. And by the time of the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century, despite the Luddite reaction, we had this machinery of civil, this uh, civilization of machinery that had all kinds of potential. Marx thought, for instance, that automated machinery could end human labor and bring human leisure and free us all from, from the burden of labor. And so uh, also, uh, of course, uh, for many, not for all, not for the radical thinkers, capitalism was going to free markets. This was part of the general concept of freedom spreading in society, and that all theoretically could prosper by this. Now, something uh, interesting uh, happened uh, um, with uh, the recoding of the ancient ideologies. So to put it very crudely, instead of this uh, sick, sick, uh, circular idea or cyclical view of history, we, we, we had a, a linear view of history that uh, things were always and always going to get better. And actually, this view of history is uh, Judeo-Christian in origins. Notice the Judeo-Christian view is certainly not cyclical. Things happen once, only once. Certain key events, Christ is born, Christ dies, uh, Christ comes back to save us all, etc. It happens once, one time only, and uh, for those who are lucky, there's salvation. And so really, the modernists affirm this, this, this same basic uh, vision or, or metaphor of history. For instance, uh, Condorcet, the French thinker, he developed a theory of 10 stages of progress. It was a linear model. In 10 stages, we would go through 10 stages, and we would reach the pinnacle of progress and freedom for all. But uh, notice that this secular worldview is, is really a religious worldview. 
It's the secularization of Christianity. And maybe you have noticed uh, the, uh, di the similarities between Marxism and Christianity, that there is this notion history is meaningful, it is moving toward a certain goal, purpose, or end. It will involve some, some coming clash or apocalyptic struggle. And it will lead to some sort, some, uh, some concept of salvation, the classless society. Now also this modern concept, whether it's Marxist or any kind, also internalized the worst possible aspects of Western ideology. Because uh, the new religion became humanism. The new God became man. The forces of salvation were science, technology, and markets. And uh, for instance, uh, Comte, August Comte, the father of modern sociology, talked frequently about the church of reason. So uh, in other words, uh, this is a humanist ideology. And it defines progress in terms of the old ideologies, anthropocentrism and speciesism are not factored uh, into this uh, concept that uh, humans will progress on the backs of the, uh, through exploiting the earth and through exploiting animals. And Marxism, of course, was a thoroughly anthropocentric and speciesist ideology, just like Christianity. Now, uh, since the 17th century, progress has defined uh, according to very specific quantitative measures, such as our growing technical power over nature. The more we can exploit nature for our purposes, the more progress we're making in society. Just think about what that means for a second and where that has led us to this point and how that has led to the very opposite of anything we really call, could call progress because right now if we call this progress, we are, we, are, uh, we are at the precipice of utter disaster and yet we dare to call this civilization and we dare to call this progress still. There have been very specific measures to define progress. For instance, uh, uh, in English, we call it the gross national product. Uh, how much are we making in society that uh, people, uh, can, the, the general average, uh, or the general wages, or the general level of, uh, uh, of, of social wealth? The problem with these quantitative measures is they cannot represent intangibles such as happiness or spiritual satisfaction. And there is no direct connection between the quantity of goods and the quality of life. And it's a well-known fact that the more advanced the society and its economic and technological structure, the more modern, the more developed, the more diseases, the more divorces, the more drug addiction, the more suicide, the more depression, the more alcoholism, the more general and higher the levels of human misery. So there seems to be an inverse relationship between the material, the development of the material forces that the Enlightenment told us would bring us happiness and the actual true state of happiness of people in society. Now I said that some of the modern uh, radical thinkers, um, they believed in all of this, but uh, they, they, they made a very specific uh, condition upon how to measure progress. Because again, in a class society, progress means the greater, uh, the more extraction of wealth, and this wealth was always distributed unequally. So theorists like Rousseau and Condorcet and Marx said, no, no, this is not progress. We believe in progress. We believe in the domination of nature. We believe in the powers of science and technology. And we believe uh, in wealth so long as all of this is equally distributed, so long as everyone benefits equally, then we have progress. So one way to look at uh, the, the essence or structure of capitalism is to realize that it is uh, what the economists call a zero-sum game. That means that we cannot all rise together. We cannot all share collective wealth that some people win only if others lose. So, as Marx saw, on the one side of the production of wealth is the production of poverty. Capitalists win only because workers lose. Powerful states win only because less powerful states lose. Europe becomes rich only because Africa is impoverished. And the cities and palaces of modernity were built on the backs of slave labor. Now, the most fucking obscene zero-sum game of all that has defined civilization for 10,000 years 
involves the game of humans over animals. The greatest zero-sum game, because the biggest class of, uh, of uh, slavery ever, has been animals, and we have benefited off the blood and backs and body parts of animals for 10,000 years now. And so every human virtually is an oppressor. Every human has gained something because animals have lost. And this economy would fall apart in a second without vivisection, factory farming, fur farming, and uh, all of the various ways in which we exploit animals. So if we were to ask an animal, what does progress mean to you? The animal would say progress for humans means regress for us. For us, humanism is barbarism. For us, the light of reason brings darkness. And for us, science is sadism. We recognize that the concept of progress uh, is in incredibly problematic, uh, that uh, it has not yet uh, been formulated uh, except in a way that uh, is based upon uh, exploitation and actually undermines uh, our own interests. But I've said that I think that we need this concept of progress uh, as a moral map or compass to, to get us to a better place. How are we going to gauge if we've created a better society, a more just society, a more equal society, a society where animals and humans and the earth are no longer exploited without some concept like progress? Even the primitivists, like John Zerzan, who completely rejects civilization and the notion of progress, are assuming a notion of progress. So, uh, in other words, if we go back to the Pleistocene era, to uh, a time of hunting and gathering tribes, we've gone to a better world, and that means progress. So progress means two things. It certainly means things have changed, and it means they've changed for the better. And so the question becomes, what do we mean by better? And who defines better? Always be careful who's using the word progress. I suggest uh, that this new concept of uh, progress, if it's going to be viable, uh, is uh, going to have to be uh, holistic. We'll have to grasp the profound unity and interconnectedness of, of the human world, the animal world, and the environment. It has to recognize the profound transformations we have to make in our psyches and in our life ways. It uh, calls for revolutionary transformations in all aspects of our lives. And it calls for an end of this zero-sum game. We must construct a world where some people do not win because other beings, other beings lose. We must construct a world in which everyone's interests, if possible, can be harmonized. Now, have you ever heard this idea that history is random, that history is flux? Uh, it goes back to you know, this ancient worldview. There's no pattern or coherence to history at all. What I want to suggest is that there is a coherence, at least in modern history, and that is a way in which we can measure progress. And this will be according to, for instance, the universalization of rights. Rights, of course, started off as a white elite capitalist discourse. As Marx uh, well pointed out, uh, this discourse uh, disguised particular interests as general interests. The rights of man really were the rights of capitalists. So if, if, if we can trace a notion of progress, for instance, from, uh, say, uh, capitalists to, uh, to labor, from patriarchal rule to uh, equality of the sexes, if we can make our moral community broader to include not just white people and their rights, but uh, people of color, and their rights, and that they are seriously equal in substantive ways with the rest of us. And we can broaden this community more to make also equal uh, people who are gay, lesbian, transgender, transsexual, etc. And if we can include and, 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 and broaden our moral community even more to include the disabled, and we can include in this community even more, that last great qualitative step, that massive boundary, that Rubicon that we have to cross. So that we recognize that non-human animals belong to our community and we belong to theirs. This is the universalization of rights. And I believe in Ecuador now, even though there's uh, conceptual di difficulties with applying this concept, 
They are talking about the rights of nature. So do you see our community here? Our community here is not Italy. Uh, it's certainly not certain privileged or elite people within Italy. Exactly. It's all people of all kinds within Italy equally. That's it's true. all of Europe equally. Thank it's all of the Western world equally. Thank it's all of the Southern world and the undeveloped or undeveloped or the developing world equally. And that's where humanists stop. And this is where we, re where we need to begin. Okay. Equally including all non-human animals. Because they are sentient beings like we are. Because we are animals too. And because everything we have, every moral capacity, every capacity to think, we got from the animals through an evolutionary continuum. And of course we are different from animals. No, they can't build spaceships. No, they don't do algebra. No, they don't write romantic poetry like Shelley. God damn it, can you swim like a whale? Can you fly like an eagle? Can you hear like a bat? Are you as beautiful as a cat? Do you smell as good as a cat? To single out reason as the criterion for uh, the moral universe and for who gets rights and who doesn't and who belongs in the community and who doesn't is absolutely absurd and arbitrary. Now, if giraffes were as arrogant and bigoted and ignorant as the human race were, unless you had a neck that was 20 feet tall, you would not have any rights. How would you like to live in an imperialistic giraffe world where they vivisect you, they, uh, they cut you up for food. They torch you in any number, of, any number of ways just because you don't have a long neck. That's how arbitrary our moral code is. We have made two mistakes. Here's one way I would summarize human thinking based on two mistakes. We have overestimated our capacity for reason. Are you really a rational being? Do you ever get angry? Have you ever had an addiction? Have you ever broken up with a boyfriend or girlfriend? I will never call that asshole again. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, we're animals, we have an id, we have a violent core, we have a sexual core. There's not a second of a day we don't think about sex or violence. I don't know about you, but every day I think about something violent. I've That's got 25 people so. on my list, how about you? We're not so rational, are we, okay? We, 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 we try to keep it together, but you know, we, we fall apart sometimes. And like when you try to deal with an addiction, it's impossible because our will, our reason, it, you know, we, we do irrational things and we can't control things with our, well, with our reason like we think we are. We're not the captain of the ship. Look at this shameful, disgraceful species, Homo sapiens. I think they meant to say Homo rapiens. No intelligent species destroys its own environment. We lack the foresight to plan for the future. We know why all the great past civilizations have collapsed. It's not a secret. It's because they exhausted their resources, they cleared their forests, they ran out of the, the vital uh, uh, of resources that they needed to survive, and they collapsed. And look at us, we're running out of oil, we're addicted to oil, yet we keep using it. And Bill McKibben, the environmentalist, just wrote a very important article uh, with, with some basic mathematical formulas. And he said, when we use the oil reserves they already have and are planning to use, we will reach that tipping point and pass it forever. We're repeating the mistakes of past civilizations. They maybe didn't have an excuse or, or had an excuse. We don't. We are exhausting our resource supply and we are just waiting for the catastrophe to happen. Don't tell me about homo sapiens. Don't tell me about rational man. Now I said we made two mistakes uh, in history. One is overestimating our rationality. There's a second one. We have underestimated the rationality of animals. We have underestimated their emotional complexity and the sophistication of their lives. And we are so stupid we think because they don't speak in human language they don't have a language or thought process at all. And uh, now we know, uh, and I can only say there have been four decades now of literature in a new scientific field called cognitive ethology, which is based on uh, the study of animal intelligence. You may, for instance, know the writer Mark Beckoff. That's an example of what I'm talking about. So we are now at a crossroads in our history. We are at a crossroads. The main drama of our time, so which eventful. road will we choose into, into the future or into our futures? 
Will we choose the road that leads to peace and stability or the one verging toward war and chaos? Will we choose the road that leads to social justice or the one that sharpens inequality and poverty? Will we stay in the same trail of uncontrolled growth and uh, rampant capitalism, unsustainable economic systems? Will we radically reconstruct our economies uh, and our institutions, which means we will radically reconstruct our systems to be democratic? Will we move toward the great unraveling of everything? Or will we move to the great turning where we finally learn to live in partnership? with other forms of life on this earth. The windows of opportunity are closing and closing quickly. The actions that humanity now takes or fails to take will be decisive forever. It will determine whether our future and that of biodiversity and the earth is hopeful or bleak, or maybe we could say um, whether it's bad or just nightmarish. We're living in the aftermath of 10,000 years of war on the planet war on one another, and war on the animals. And we have reached this point right here, right now, universally, globally, we are all in it together. And we are facing the greatest challenge that has ever stared this species in the face. So can we radically retool our thinking and our societies uh, to avoid a dovetail, a spinning into a fatal crash or can we rise from these ashes phoenix-like and reconstitute ourselves as, as, a, as, as a species that is worthy of the name Homo sapiens? There is no guarantee we will survive. We are not here put, we are not put here by God. No God is going to save us. All other Homo species have disappeared. Homo erectus, Homo habilis, extinct. Homo neanderthalensis, extinct. Homo sapiens, on the path of extinction. Now, the result may be horrible for us to contemplate. We may not have the will or the ability to meet this challenge. I see no signs that anyone is taking action. The corporations are continuing full speed ahead to exploit all remaining oil and gas deposits. Ironically, because the ice caps are melting, because of global warming, they are now moving into ice caps, which previously were impassable, to exploit more gas and oil supplies. The governments aren't doing anything about it because they're in the pockets of corporations. The NGOs, like Greenpeace, are largely co-opted by corporations. That leaves us, the people. And why aren't we rioting in the streets? Why aren't there mass demonstrations every damn day on this planet? Because everything is at stake now. Everything is at stake, and I can't underestimate that. And no, I'm not an apocalyptic nut. I'm talking about what science is saying to us. Everything is at stake. Why aren't we angry? Why aren't we out in the streets? Why aren't we tearing this shit down? So, from the perspective of the animals and the earth, the best thing that could happen is that human beings die off and die off totally and rapidly as possible. They would rejoice. Because if we can't learn how to live on this planet, we don't deserve to live on this planet. I'm afraid we've overstayed our welcome. And you could take a worm out of an ecosystem, you could take a butterfly out of an ecosystem, uh, you could take uh, a beetle out of an ecosystem, and that ecosystem would suffer because they are so important to the earth. But if you take Homo sapiens out of the ecosystem, it's the only species you can remove. So except for the cats and dogs and the animals in the zoos, that everything else will, will start to heal and flourish. Here is my hope for you, my optimism for today. There is a genre of books and documentaries and uh, books with pictures. Let's just call it the, let's call the genre Life After Humans. Let's say, according to uh, the hypothesis, that a virus kills this entire species within 24 hours. What will happen? All of the domestic animals will suffer and die. They'll be trapped. As many zoo animals will, will suffer and die. Some will break out and live. Nuclear power plants will blow up. And for a temporary time, there will be a great toxic environment on this planet that will kill life. But in time, the rivers will become clean. 
The uh, air will become fresh. The forest will regrow. The earth will regenerate. In 100 years, New York City will be gone. From wall erosion, rain erosion, and nature will reclaim New York City like everything else, and it will all be back to planet Earth. So it's increasingly obvious that um, the fate of all life is inextricably bound, and that uh, we hold um, this whole planet um, in our hands. Progress can no longer entail a zero-sum game where we advance at the expense of the Earth or the animals. We must eliminate the false opposition between society and nature, between human and non-human animal. And we must learn to become good citizens of the bio-community instead of being the barbarians and invaders that are bringing the whole house down. Thank you. Grazie.